Okay. So what we've understood so far is, we've understood that the primary structure of the protein is referred to as a single polypeptide chain. It's quite long, okay? I mean, it can, it can go as long as you want it to. And the secondary structure of the protein is what happens when that same polypeptide chain starts to form pleats or coils. And those pleats or coils are called the alpha helix and beta pleated sheets. And if you remember in the previous video, the reason why secondary structures start to happen is because of the formation of hydrogen bonds. Okay, so now what happens is uh, we go into something known as the tertiary structure. I want you to see what happens uh, to that same polypeptide chain. That same polypeptide chain starts to further coil and fold within itself it starts to become uh, one of my students said it beautifully one of my students said uh it feels like taking a long uh like a long string or a thread and you're just crumpling it up like a piece of paper and you're just crumpling it up and the paper's flat but when you crumple it up it becomes a ball and it's the same thing with this the protein was like a chain and the protein starts to coil and crumple within itself and fold within itself to form a three-dimensional shape and that's a beautiful analogy that my student went with and i'm gonna i'm gonna use it i hope she doesn't hear this i hope she doesn't listen to this video because she might sue me oh she won't okay i hope not at least <laughs> okay so coming back to this uh the tertiary structure of the protein is described as the further folding of the polypeptide chain, a polypeptide chain, my mistake, sorry, is the further folding of a polypeptide chain to form a specific three-dimensional structure. Now, I just want you to take a moment to look at this part, uh, this picture, where I've put a purple dot uh, on the secondary structure and a green colored dot on the secondary structure. Notice that they were far away. That's the beginning of the polypeptide chain on the left and the end of the polypeptide chain on the right. What has happened now is, it's the same chain, but look at their distance. They're quite close to each other. The reason why they're quite close to each other is because the chain has folded further. And something that uh, amino acids that were at great distances from each other are now quite close to each other because the chain has further folded and become a three-dimensional structure. I just wanted to show you uh, that comparison between the secondary and tertiary structure like that. Now, I'm going to draw out a three-dimensional structure. Again, it looks very complicated. And if you remember in the previous video, you might have a bit of... Uh, you might remember, you are like, oh, wait, this is that coiled, tangled ribbon thingy that he showed me in the previous video. And that's exactly it. That's the coil ribbon tangle stuff that we were talking about that looked extremely complicated. But now you know that, hey, I think I kind of understand what's going on here. It's just a single chain. It's just a single chain, and the single chain is just folding within itself. Now, one of the most important questions that they love asking in the exam is, what causes the polypeptide chain to further fold into a three-dimensional structure? And the answer here is extremely important. The answer is because it's the interactions between the R groups of the amino acids. The R groups are the ones that are the reasons why proteins can have tertiary structures. You see, the interesting thing is, I'm going to zoom in and I'm just going to put those two amino acids. I'm going to represent those two purple dots as amino acids. And for example, these amino acids may have R groups that are partially positive and partially negative. And because the R groups are partially positive and partially negative, they may form hydrogen bonds with each other, causing the protein to fold. Some amino acids will have R groups with a ionic charge, with ionic charges, positive charges and negative charges, not to be confused with partially positive and partially negative, by the way. And when they have these positive charges and negative charges, they can form something known as ionic bonds, not hydrogen bonds. Some amino acids may have R groups with sulfur. And when they have R groups with sulfur, 
the sulfur can link together to form a very strong covalent disulfide bridge, which causes the protein to coil further. And some amino acids have R groups which are hydrophobic. If you remember what hydrophobic means, hydrophobic just basically means they are not able to interact with water. And because they don't interact with water, they start to interact with each other and they will form something known as weak hydrophobic interactions between those amino acids. The four bonds that can cause the polypeptide chain to fold further to form a 3D structure are as follows. They can be the hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, weak hydrophobic interactions, and disulfide bridges. Now, what you have to know is hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, and the hydrophobic interactions are weak and disulfide bonds or disulfide bridges are strong. Uh, in, in the way that the weak ones can be easily influenced by temperature, pH, and such, but the strong bonds are not so easily broken down or influenced by external factors. Uh, some of my students usually ask me to explain further about the hydrophobic interactions. They can't imagine it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to draw out a single polypeptide chain. All right. And if you notice, in those single polypeptide chains, I've shaded... Um, a few of them are uh, as red in color, the red in color ones, where the ones in white are just polar amino acids. And if you remember, polar means they have charges, and the ones in red are non-polar amino acids. And they do not have charges. And as a reminder, polar means they can interact with water, non-polar means they avoid water. Now imagine if I put this chain into water, look at what happens to the chain. The polar ones will face outside and the non-polar will curl inwards. Why does the non-polar one curl inwards? Because remember, they hate water. They don't want to interact with water because they cannot interact with water. So because they cannot interact with water, what do they do? They interact with each other. And thus, in an attempt to avoid water, they will cause that single straight chain to form a 3D structure. That's how hydrophobic bonds are created. I hope you understand this part as well. So what we've done so far is we've looked at the primary, secondary, and tertiary structure of a protein. Uh, let's try to look at it again and let's compare two polypeptide chains. So what you have here is you have two polypeptide chains, one on the left, one on the right. And what happens is the chain on the left forms a secondary structure. And you can see the secondary structure over there. Uh, they have the alpha helix. And the alpha helixes are the three coils. And for the polypeptide chain on the right, it is forming an alpha helix. You see two beta pleated sheet. The beta pleated sheet are represented by the arrows. And it has another alpha helix. And if you remember, secondary structures form due to hydrogen bonds between NH and C double bond O groups. The tertiary structure, and as you can see this, the, the chain on the left folds further to form a tertiary structure, and the chain on the right also folds to form a different type of tertiary structure. So as the chain folds further, the chain on the left folds differently, the chain on the right folds differently. Uh, the reason, it can be due to the type of amino acids they have. And just as a brief, uh, just to remind you, the reason why tertiary structures are formed is due to the interaction of the R groups in the amino acids. So we have, uh, these two proteins have different tertiary structures. That's what we just have to see for this. Now, by definition, quaternary structure is a protein made up of two or more polypeptide chains. If it's only made up of a single polypeptide chain, it will usually stop at tertiary. But if the protein is made up of two or more polypeptide chains, then it has to be referred to as quaternary. Let's look at insulin. Insulin is one of my favorite examples to use. It doesn't come out so much in the exam. Um, like, like, for example, you will be talking about insulin, uh, insulin's function in chapter 14 in A2 biology. Uh, you don't have to know the structure of insulin. You don't have to know how it looks like. Uh, 
but I like using insulin as an example because insulin is a protein that acts as a hormone. Insulin is a protein hormone that controls your blood sugar level. It prevents your blood sugar level from going too high, right? And uh, if you do not have enough insulin in your body or if your body cannot produce insulin, you get a disease known as diabetes mellitus. Now, uh, forget about the function of insulin. Let's go back to its structure. So for insulin to function, you need two polypeptide chains. And I'm going to draw out the two polypeptide chains. There's a chain at the top and the chain at the bottom. Both chains show a primary structure. Primary structure is just a sequence of amino acids. And then both chains will then start to form a secondary structure. How do I know that's a secondary structure? The chain on the top, the red color one, has a beta pleated sheet and an alpha helix. The chain at the bottom, the blue color one, has two alpha helixes. And those are the secondary structure. And look what happens to the red chain. And look what happens to the blue chain. They further fold within themselves to form a sort of 3D structure. That is fine, but that's not insulin yet. Insulin is what happens when both these chains interact with each other. Only when these two chains interact with each other, insulin is, uh, I hate to use this word, insulin is born or insulin is that. So insulin is actually a protein that is made up of two separate polypeptide chains. And those two chains have to interact with each other. And because insulin is made up of two polypeptide chains, insulin is referred to as a quaternary protein or a protein with a quaternary structure. That's what we have to understand about quaternary, quaternary structures. So that's an insulin protein. Um, and what are some of the interactions that happen between the two polypeptide chains? Quaternary structures are also happening due to the interactions of the R groups. So they'll have the same bonds that are present in tertiary structures. They would have hydrogen bonds, they would have disulfide bridges, they would have ionic bonds, and they would also have weak hydrophobic interactions. In summary, a primary structure is one polypeptide chain made up of a sequence of amino acids. A secondary structure is just the same polypeptide chain, but coiling or folding due to hydrogen bonds between the NH and C double bond O groups, and they can form the alpha helix and beta pleated sheet. A tertiary structure is what happens when the polypeptide chain is just the same polypeptide chain further folding to form a 3D structure. And how the tertiary structures happen is due to R group interactions of the amino acids. They have hydrogen bonds, they have ionic bonds, weak hydrophobic interactions, and disulfide bridges. And last but not least is quaternary structure. A quaternary structure is a protein made up of two or more polypeptide chains interacting with each other. I've drawn out one chain in blue, one chain in red, and also one chain in, I think that's green, that looks like green or the sea foam green, green, uh, sea foam green, I think. Yeah, but anyway, there are three polypeptide chains in this case, in just my example here. And all the three chains are interacting with each other by the means of hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, hydrophobic interactions, and also disulfide bridges. If you remember in the vi previous video, uh, we were we were basically talking about antibodies and I said to you oh god this is a very difficult protein to describe no it's not it's actually not a very difficult protein to describe right now because let's look at it of course this is in color in the exam you will not be able to see the colors but it's okay but just just for the sake of trying to understand this protein we can determine or we can discern that this protein molecule is actually made up of four polypeptide chains. And how do I know it's four polypeptide chains? Because we have a chain in gold, like a gold yellow color. We have a chain in a blue color. We have one in green and we also have one in pink. So it's four polypeptide chains. Immediately, because this protein is made up of more than two polypeptide chains, this is a quaternary protein antibody is referred to as a protein with a quaternary structure or it's also referred to as a 
quaternary protein. And within each of the chain, you can see that it's folded to form a sort of 3D structure. You can also see the beta pleated sheets, the arrows that are forming around the area. So that is just basically what we have to understand for antibodies.